And good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Witches on Lockdown. You're in for a real treat today. This is Dr. John Michael Salvato, for those who don't know me, um, also known as Daddy Warlock. Um, I'm going to be your host and the producer for today's program, bringing these amazing presenters, witches and energy workers, warlocks and mages to the screen uh, for you guys over the next five and a half, six hours. And uh, we're going to get started with the ways of the flora, uh, an incredible presentation. If you've ever wondered about plant magic and about the, the mysteries of working with plant spirits and, and creating potions and everything that goes with that, you're going to want to stick around and hear what Andrea Savar has to say. We'll be back and I'll introduce her in just a moment. everyone <laughs> we are back hello andrea we're so glad you're here uh, for those who don't know you let me just do a little bit of of bragging on you because i know that you are too humble to do that yourself uh folks andrea savar wears many hats in this wildlife including the hats of mother and gallery owner jewelry designer artist and author but the one that she says goes to the core of who she is is a worker of the mystical arts. And Andrea began working as a child with her family that nurtured all of the unique gifts in a, in a tradition that combines the Italian ways with the Pacific Northwest pioneer life and, and Persian mysticism. And, uh, and she is gonna be sharing with you, as I said, the ways of the flora today. Andrea, I am so thrilled to have you here. Me too, and thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna get out of the studio here and go backstage so that you have the floor all to yourself. Thank you so much, John Michael. I'm excited right. about today. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited to share with you uh, a collection of plants that I have gathered um, for today's presentation. Um, I'm going to be using a PowerPoint, but don't worry about taking notes from it because I will actually download a PDF version of it after the class so you can have it for further reference. So I just want to get started. And um, this one, I'll have John Michael pull up my my PowerPoint for me. Perfect. There it is on interconnection. And this is something that is extremely important for me. I'm going to actually switch over to my screen too. Here we go. So interconnection of the flora with our own being. This is where I feel like we really need to start um, when we're working with plants on many different levels. Plants are connected to us in ways that I think many of us have lost over the generations, quite certainly in uh, the 20th century. So I wanna start off with just the very simple idea that air is one that we share with our plants, as many of all of you know, that we have a symbiosis with plant life regarding our air. So what we breathe <clears throat> and they are cleansing for us and vice versa. And this is where I believe that working with plants on both a cellular level as well as on, as well as on a spiritual level is so beneficial to um, all beings involved. So, that's where that is air. Now, fire is when we get into working with medicine. So if you think of um, how we extract plant medicine, um, we often will use a form of distillation or creating an elixir. And with that, we use our fire. Now, this is a process that I'll talk about a little later in the class when we get into actually making potions. But if you think about that combination of the fire and the fire in our body, especially if we have have um, fevers or anything where we're burning out um, uh, different illnesses, we're using these plants in the way that we use cooling and fire and air and water all within our, all within our compact body. So that is um, where fire comes in. Now water, of course, the water that we are giving to the plants is going to be also represented in the water that we have in our own body. So if we are giving our plants clean water and healthy water, that's going to be something that they're going to give back to us when we ingest those, that particular plant life. And then of course, 
this is the one I want to talk most about, which of course is spirit and our spiritual connection to plant life. I don't, I feel like when we're children, we intuit this particular relationship in a way that's so natural that as we get older, we kind of forget about all that wonder that we have when we're in the garden, playing with the plants, playing with the flowers, the trees. It just is so natural for our spirit to be connected to them at that time. So when you want to connect right now as an adult with plants, especially plant spirits, um, I feel like the easiest way to do that is probably the simplest way. And I know a lot of you are in apartments right now, so it's not as easy to get outside. If you have, um, if you are in a home where you do have a garden, the easiest way, I think the first way to connect with plant spirits is working with trees. They have a particular energy about them that's very calming and um, open to working with humans. So the best thing to do is simply find a tree that you have, that you has caught your eye for whatever reason. If this tree has been You've always just thought, wow, what a lovely tree. I, I really wondered about that particular tree's history or, and it can even be a sapling. It doesn't have to be, you know, the 300 year old tree. It can be just a young sapling tree. Go sit with it. And if you're in an apartment, you can do this from distance. You can do this from looking out your window and seeing a tree that might be in your line of view. If you don't have trees in your line of view and you're in an apartment, um, another very easy way to do this is a tree that you remember being somewhere where you've been out. Like if you've gone to a park and there was a tree that really caught your eye and you thought, wow, that's, that's, a, special, that's a special being. Just close your eyes and focus on being with that particular tree and you will transport your own energy and their energy as well. So while you're doing this, just, I think when you first start off, just let your mind kind of open, greet the tree in a very simple way, just say hello like you would to a person, and just kind of let yourself um, slowly settle into a state of calm. One of the things that helps a lot is watching how the leaves move. So if you see that there's a little breeze and there's kind of a slow sway to the tree, let your body even follow that kind of sway with it. And it's amazing how relaxing and connecting that particular way of communicating with trees is. Now, as you go a little deeper, you might, I'm going to say that you'll, you'll hear messages coming to you, but they might be just in a feeling or in a memory or in a very simple smile. And it'll just start kind of that way until you slowly, over time, build more of a relationship with that tree. Now, I want to just talk also about when we're taking things from trees or from the land around us. Um, it's very important to ask when you take something. And I usually just say when when you're going to take something, explain what you're going to use it for. Like when I'm making a potion, I always tell the tree what I'm going to be using it for. And I just feel this, um, if the tree or the plant is giving me permission, you feel it. Just let yourself kind of take a minute and ask, is this feeling right? Or is it feeling like Maybe I need to choose a different tree or a different plant. Most of the time, they're very willing to help because of the symbiotic relationship that we have with plant life. So I would say just listen to that inner voice, which is not just coming from you. It actually is the plant communicating with you. Um, some of the plants are going to be a little more open to this than others, and we'll talk about that when we get into uh, more specific plants that I've chosen for the class that have a more of a globality. But trees, generally speaking, are often very, um, very keen on helping on helping us. If you're going to take a branch, especially for wand work, just again ask them very simply, and when you do so. Um, we want to thank the tree. Now, if you have, or the plants, so if you're growing these plants yourself, you're already in a relationship that you've cultivated with them um, because you're watering them, you're caring for them, and 
you are giving them the promise that you will continue the life of their um, children. So um, that in itself is already that particular relationship. If you're out and you're foraging or if you're in nature um, in a park or um, even just, you know, in someone else's, uh, someone else's land, um, you really do need to bring just a little something. It could even be just a glass of water that you're giving back to the earth. It can be um, the promise that you will come back and um, replant what you've taken if you have too much. All of these things are just simple ways of a reciprocity that is important for the magic itself. And also just for being a courteous, spirit humans um, on this planet, especially right now. So that is one of the ways that um, we communicate and we create a relationship with the plants that we're working on. One other thing, and this is especially if you are cultivating your own plants, um, my mother is the master of cultivating plants and making them grow three sizes more than normal. Um, and one of the things that she does is she talks to them all the time. She tells them stories. She talks to them the way that she talks to her granddaughter with that much love and caring. And she always, when it's time to harvest um, at the end of whatever that cycle is for the plant, she always reassures them that there will be um, a future generation for their plants. She gathers their seeds and she keeps them and when she tucks them to bed. So those are some of the things that I highly recommend doing and you will see a definite uh, return of energy to you and to your magical work that is significant. Now let me go ahead and start the next slide here is the study of the flora. Now, this is something that has gone back um, to our great, great, great grandmothers, and of course, all the way back to really the beginning of human, uh, human time. We've been using plants in all different ways from magic to healing um, since the dawn of, of man. Um, but here are some works that are specifically, I feel, very useful historically and also just in um, current workings. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about two of them specifically because some of the others are a little more well known. Um, two that are lesser known books are Poiré's Flore Médicale, which is in French. It's from 1814. I do believe there are translations. And I will just show you a little bit what this looks like. Here's one of the copies. And inside, thank you, inside um, each particular plant has a um, hand-drawn plate and then each page has all the different medicinal qualities. This is um, comes in eight volumes so there is a tremendous amount of history and knowledge in this particular book. So if you can find a copy of it, that doesn't have to be an original copy, but if you can find a copy in English or if you speak French, I highly recommend adding that one to your library. And then the second one is actually, um, I'll go back to my slide, if you will, uh, perfect, is um, Edward Holmes' Familiar Wildflowers. And this one you can actually get just on um, Amazon or any of the other eBay. You can get an original from the 1878 to the early 1900s for maybe 20 or $30. And it's a wonderful book also of medicinal, historic, um, all different uses. So I highly recommend that one. And it's not as well known as some of the others. And then for more contemporary workings, especially with plant magic, um, Judy Ann Knox's uh, book um, is fantastic. The Modern Witchcraft Guide to Magical Herbs. It is a wonderful book. It only focuses on herbs, but it's a great resource and a beautiful book. So those are some that I recommend. Now we'll go to our very first plant that I want to talk about, which is a very special plant in my family, and that is rue. Make sure I have that centered there. So rue is very important to the Italian tradition. It is probably the oldest plant that was ever used um, in the garden. So this, this is a plant that um, 
is commonly thought to be a very protective and healing plant. When someone has been ill, um, we put a little uh, pouch around their neck with rue inside of it, and that is supposed to um, stave off any future illness and help them heal more quickly. Um, we also use rue, and so that's an amulet form. Then we also use rue very simply in our garden because if you look at the way that it grows and its aspects just in how it works in its natural environment, it shows you what it's going to do for you on a magical level as well. So in the garden, it is um, it is extremely potent. The smell is it's a very strong smell. And what it does is it um, repulses any type of um, harmful insects. So anything that's going to attack your crop or attack the fragile plants. And I believe this is why it's also in some ways called mother of the herbs because it has that motherly protective quality of protecting the weaker plants and the smaller plants. So um, it's also going to do the same thing for us on an energetic level. Now, when we're working with rue, another, so I, I highly recommend planting it in your garden for, you know, twofold, the protection of your other plants and also the energetic portion as well. But when you're using it in um, magic, there are two ways in my family, and one is the Italian way and one is the Persian way. <laughs> so the well, I'll do the Persian way. We usually dry it, grind it up into um, powder, and then form it into little incense um, cones. And we use that in all of the corners of the house to dispel any negative energy or any unwanted evil eye, um, anything that is we feel might be throwing throwing us off energetically. And my grandmother would do this regularly when she felt that the house needed cleansing or if a person needed cleansing, she would do it three times around the head and then we would kiss the Quran and it was good. So that's one of the ways that the Persians use rue. And they use it primarily in, um, in the incense form. Now in the Italian way, this is my other grandmother, would use it to clean the floor. And it was an energetic cleaning of the floor. So the first way that you do it is you clean your floor like you normally would. And most of us, well, most people back then had a hardwood floor, which is a little easier to work with. If you have carpet, you can grind it into the powder and sprinkle it through all the carpet and then vacuum over it to do the same type of a thing. But when you're washing the floor um, with water, what you do is you um, take rue, bay leaf, and I like to throw in a little bit of rosemary in there from the garden. Make a little um, bouquet with twine. Get very, very hot water, and this is after you've already soaked and cleaned everything. Put it in the hot water and just let it steep for maybe five or ten minutes, and then go ahead and start washing your floor from the farthest to uh, part the farthest away from your door just wash all of the all of the floors and while you're doing it energetically begin clearing away anything that might not be useful to you anymore in that space and anything that might be coming from the outside in is being pushed out so when you get to the door this is where you want to open it and if you're in an apartment um, it can be a little trickier so if you're in an apartment i would open the door go ahead and step outside lock it and if you can either sit on your stoop or take a look and just let anything that has been re just a residual energy clear away as you're taking that walk and your floor is drying same thing if you're in a house, but you can leave the door open so that energy has a way to escape. It will anyway, but it's just kind of a nice symbolic. And again, give it about 10 or 15 minutes. And in that time, just go ahead and focus on the things that you need to release. And then when you go back in, you will visually notice that your room is lighter. It will brighten everything and the energy will be completely different. And then you'll have the protection of rue woven in to your um, floor. So that is the wonderful plant rue. And there's quite a bit more that I will add to a document that I will upload a little bit later for everyone to read on the history. But that is, those are the ways that I like to use, we like to use rue in the family. 
So now I'll go to our next plant, which is nettles. Now, I've had a lot of people asking me questions about nettles recently because they thought that the purple dead nettle was actually a stinging nettle. Purple dead nettle is part of the mint family, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, stinging nettles are, this is the perfect time of year right now because they are actually at a prime moment to harvest. So I want to talk about first the energetic properties of nettles, which are um, courage for the most part and resilience. I really like to focus on the courage aspect of nettles and the resilience and purification in the bodily aspect. So on the energy aspect, when you're also watching the way that um, this particular pamphlet plant grows, you have to be courageous to approach it. It's not a plant that's easily going to give of itself, unlike dandelions or um, other plants that are happily uh, wanting you to harvest them. So um, nettles are a little bit more reticent, and that is why they have the stinger. So just the actual process of um, cultivating or harvesting nettles uh, takes a bit of courage. And it is courage that will be well rewarded if you take that step. So when you're out in nature and you want to actually um, uh, harvest the nettles, you need to be wearing protective gear. Now, my husband, who is a forager uh, and has quite a bit of experience from the French Alps where he grew up foraging, assures me that if you don't, if you hold your breath while you're cultivating nettles, they won't sting you. I'm not sure that's true, so I definitely use gloves. <laughs> and I really do recommend you doing the same. Um, but if you ever care to try it, you're welcome to, and we can prove him right or wrong, but um, I, I would use the gloves. So anyway, gloves, and um, you need to have a sack that you put them in that also is going to be uh, burlap or something very heavy because they will sting you through the sack. Um, they will actually sting you up until the point when they are blanched in, uh, in water. So just something to be very aware of that the sting continues after they've been harvested, after they've been cut. So when you're doing this and you approach a nettle, this is one of the plants you need to take a little more time getting to know before you just go ahead and start, you know, walking away and putting them in your bag. You also, when you're harvesting somewhere that is not in your on your own land, don't take more than um, one third of what is available because the earth, the other animals, the other creatures, they need it as much as we do. So we need to leave, make sure that there's enough for that plant to come back the next spring. We don't want it to take everything away all at once. So please be mindful of that, um, especially with the early spring plants because they are some of our very first plants coming up and the most courageous of all. So I would just take a second when you're working with nettle, which also has, even though it is a masculine, uh, related to masculine energy, it also has a very strong um, feminine quality, um, especially because it's related to childbirth and increasing women's milk supply. So there, I approach it by saying, hello, mother or father nettle, may I please use you in my soup? Because that's usually what I use nettles for, and or my tea. And um, assure them, again, that you will bring back enough for their babies, or you will use everything that you take from them um, to restore your own body and to give yourself courage and resilience. And then go ahead and start your harvest. Um, I have a recipe that I put in uh, the classroom for a nettle soup that I find particularly lovely. And I really encourage everyone who has access to nettles to give it a try. It's incredibly restorative. While you're uh, consuming this particular plant, your body is fortified in a way that um, is quite exceptional. Also, another way to use it is in tea, and you can just go online and get, you know, nettle tea from several pretty reputable tea sources. And again, it's something that is extremely healthy and uh, vital for the body. 
So that is just a little bit about the wonderful nettle. And again, I will have more about the history in um, the document that I will upload. I just uh, want to get through all of our wonderful plants. So here is our next one, is the fig tree. <clears throat> And maybe I should, does anyone have any questions at this point or um, is everyone doing okay? Well, if you have questions, please don't, don't be shy. Go ahead and put them up and I'll get to all of them or we can get to them at the end, whichever is easiest, but just pop on there if you have any, any questions about any of these plants. So figs, now I chose figs because it is um, considered to be the tree of life. And it is the oldest of all um, uh, trees that have been, um, I can't find the word, uh, domesticated. It is the oldest domesticated tree. And the very first uh, of these trees that we know was domesticated is about 9,000 years before Christ in Jericho. Now, figs have been known to treat um, pretty much everything, like the actual medicinal qualities of figs through history. They've been used for everything from leprosy to um, cancer. It's just, it's gone across the board. I find the most useful aspect of the fig tree in medicinal um, uses is to, is to create a poultice generally, generally for warts or any type of skin. Um, issue. They work extremely well. And um, there's an actual remedy, uh, recipe for that as well. Now, the other very common use of the fig tree is for divination. Now, the fig tree divination, we generally use the leaf. And I have a fig tree that I was going to bring in one of the leaves to show you, but it's a sapling. And I, I really didn't want to take away any of its um, vitality because it is so young. But the leaves of a fig tree, especially a healthy fig tree, are huge. They're about this big and they're just gorgeous. And what you want to do when you're using it for divination is you want to turn it over to the underside of the leaf and with a pencil or with a pen, chalk, whatever feels right, just write your question. It should be a yes or no question on the leaf. Um, if the leaf shrivels rather quickly and turns like a brownish kind of gray, then the answer is no. If it dries almost exactly as it is, then the answer is going to be yes to your question. So it's a wonderful, very ancient use of fig leaves for divination. The fruit itself is thought to attract um, love. It's an aphrodisiac, so I, that's probably where that comes from. And then of course, it's a symbol of fertility. Um, and in Italian tradition, we wear the little talismans that are called fica, and it's supposed to be, it's related to um, the uh, human genitalia, so it's supposed to create virility, fertility, um, and aid in uh, creation in all ways. So you don't have to take that as a literal um, procreation. I feel like that type of fertility and love when you plant a big tree in your garden, it's also a fertility of your space, your ideas, your creative flow. It has that energy of love, the all-encompassing love, um, very much present in its being. So it gives you this beautiful fruit sometimes twice a year in the spring and then again in the fall when you have a mature plant and you can dry that uh, to keep through winter. So all of these aspects of fig really have to do with sustenance um, and fertility in the overall global aspects of your, of your life. So if you can plant a fig tree, I highly recommend it. If you can't find a friend who has one in their garden, <laughs> my grandparents had a huge fig tree that gave tremendous amounts of fruit every year, so much that we were bringing crates of it to, uh, to different um, soup kitchens and who would accept fresh fruit. So it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful tree to have in your life in many different ways. And if you can't have a fig tree in your life because you are in an apartment and you don't have that access, um, oh yes, Lisa, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, oh, for the Persians. The Persians really think of the, the fig tree in very similar ways to the Italians. So it has the same idea of um, <clears throat> fertility in your life. Um, it's a representation of love. So even just um, the act of giving a fig to someone in Persian culture means that um, you're showing them your eternal love, that that love will never fade or die. And um, so that for Persians is it's very, it's a beautiful way of expressing their love to you is by giving you figs. So if you have a Persian family or friend uh, who comes over and says, here's a bowl of figs, it means that they, they love you. <laughs> so yes, figs are an amazing addition to your diet. They're so healthy. And then also for your energetic um, energy. Let's go to our next plant. Now this plant is very, very special to me as well. This is mullen. Now mullen grows pretty much all across the United States. It's very abundant. It will grow in vacant lots. It will grow, um, it grows at our, the, my parents' farm. Um, we even had about six plants pop up in our garden here that we've never had before. And that I think was something too I, I wanted to mention is when you, want to have a specific plant in your garden and for whatever reason you're having a hard time finding it if it's a wild plant ask the earth to bring you one you know our root systems are all connected so when those roots um hear you and understand you especially when you're very connected to the plant life after um much practice you might be surprised to find that those plants will find your garden and they will pop up for you. And this has happened this year with mullein. It's happened in the past for me for with sunflowers and butterfly bushes and all kinds of other plants that uh, violets um, that I had uh, really had hoped to have in my garden but hadn't had time yet to source and they just presented themselves. So mullein back to mullen. Mullen is an excellent example of a plant that in the way it grows is showing you all of its uses. So the leaves themselves look like lungs, like they're really fascinating. They have this sort of fuzzy underside that almost looks like the cilia in a lung. So the leaves themselves are extremely useful for asthma, um, you want to dry all of them. Um, only pick, if you plan on keeping the plant, um, only pick about a third of the leaves that are on the plant in the springtime so it has enough energy to grow to its full stature around June, July. Um, <clears throat> so go ahead and you can dry those and they last about, you know, as long as you keep them dry for as, as long as you need them. Um, and you can use them in tea if you, you need to... Uh, I think I put a, a recipe in the notes for um, mullein tea, but you need to always strain it because of those little those little hairs that can be uh, uh, not very agreeable to drink. Um, one of the other things is also just like a vapor. Um, put it into hot water and then just put a little cloth over your head and go ahead and inhale it. And that usually helps with asthma. And I have asthma, so I've known through the years this has been very helpful for me and not harmful. So um, that is one of the aspects. Now, another aspect of it is it grows when the stem starts to grow with all of the yellow flowers on it a little bit later in spring and into summer. It grows very tall and very straight, but they also kind of bend beautifully in the wind. They're just an elegant, beautiful wild plant. So as it grows tall in that <clears throat> particular way, um, you kind of can think of the human spine and how when we are taught, when we are keeping ourselves tall and straight, how good our back feels. Um, mullen, if you crush it and make it into a salve, has also been thought to help with sciatica. So if you do that, if you have a back issue, you can make it into a salve that helps with your back. Now the flowers, which are the beautiful yellow, very delicate petals, they hold a lot of water. So um, when we when we take those um, off for use, we need to let them dry a couple of days. But they make a beautiful cough syrup that will help in the winter. So you can actually have, even though the mullein plant is from spring through summer, 
all of its aspects can be held all through winter, fall and winter. So you have their magic and their medicine with you um, all year round. Um, <clears throat> they are also, and this is on more of a magical level, but if you have any spells or any types of workings that call for graveyard dust, but you don't have access or you don't feel comfortable um, using graveyard dust, you can simply grind down dried mullein leaves, and that is an acceptable substitute. You won't have any issues with that. So I, I highly recommend that. And then again, the tall part when you're harvesting in the spring, you can save the central portion of the mullein plant can be used as a wick for candles. And that was um, used by people throughout history. It's especially powerful for any type of magical work um, because it is a protective plant in many different ways. So that is a little bit about the mighty woman. Go to our next plant. This is the evening primrose. Now the evening primrose is really special to me because it was one of the plants that came to my parents' garden and I had never seen it before, neither had they. And this was when I was maybe six or seven years old and we were working in the garden and <clears throat> it was late in the evening and I noticed this little plant that I hadn't really seen before had popped up near one of our walkways. And I was, you know, curious as I've always been and went over to see it and as the light was fading, because we water our plants, you know, in the evening so they, they absorb as much of the water as possible. We saw, um, I saw the, the little plant open. It's beautiful, almost iridescent, luminescent um, little petals. And it was just pure magic for me. It smelled, the perfume is just a beautiful, beautiful, very light, um, subtle perfume. So this is a night blooming flower. And it is um, associated because of that with lunar magic. So if you're thinking about all of the different um, aspects of evening pollinators, like you'll have um, different moths that are very attracted to the evening primrose, it's a little bit too small for bats, I believe, but I do know that the moths um, <clears throat> are pollinators for the evening primrose. It's um, because of that aspect with the moon and with um, Diana, it also has a connection to shape-shifting, specifically wolves. And I do believe that it is part of an elixir. It is one of the ingredients that um, promotes or aids in that shape-shifting magic. Now, I don't recommend doing that unless you have experience. <laughs> um, what I do recommend using it for is for any type of altar set up during the moon. Um, it has just, again, such a magical lunar feminine quality to it. If you can plant it in your garden, you'll have a whole host of evening pollinators come and um, do very significant work on your land for you. Um, if you're using it in a medicinal way, it has been known to be very effective uh, in treating PMS. I would absolutely, on this particular plant, check with a doctor or naturopath first because if you have epilepsy, um, you cannot take this plant uh, as a remedy. So this is one that you need to be very careful of. If you're using it as a remedy, please check with a physician first to make sure that there's nothing that could be harmful for you. However, using it on your altar and for magical purposes is completely recommended and encouraged and if you decide to ever plant a moon garden this is one of the ones that you should include okay let's go to our next plant the violet <clears throat> now violets as you know are very important to me my daughter's name is violets um and one of the reasons that i find violets so uh, intriguing, powerful, is we have this perception, perception of them as being the shrinking violets. They, their actual energy is the complete opposite. They are resurrection plants. They are protective. They have the sacred love wrapped into them. Um, 
Persephone is the first deity that always comes to mind uh, when I think of violets because she was picking them um, when she was taken to the underworld by Hades and when she returns in the spring, it is the first plant that uh, pops up. So it is all about that cycle of resurrection. When you're going through something in your life where you feel like you're dying and coming back again, or you, you're in the process of letting go of things and you need to come back with resurrection um, into a new purpose, a new um, path for your life, violets is an excellent plant to have with you. I like to make jelly with it because it's something that you can have all year long. And when you're feeling that need of I, you know, courage or transition that is painful, take a little spoonful, make yourself some toast. It is just revitalizing in many ways. Of course, I also make a potion with it. Um, violets are very easy to distill um, because you can actually use the leaf as well as the flower. There's an equal amount of perfume in the leaf as the flower. So when I get to the distill distillation part of the class, we'll talk about that. Um, some plants are, some plants are not. Now, <clears throat> this wonderful plant, thankfully, is so when you're using violets, I'm actually going to go ahead and go to the next one um, because it is tied in with violets, and that is parsley. Now, parsley is the other plant that Persephone brings with her this time when she's coming um, out of the underworld. So parsley is related to um, ancestors and death. Now, not in a way that you're going to die if you eat parsley. If anything, it's the opposite. <laughs> it's more that when you're using it, especially the tradition of using parsley as a garnish on your food, it is giving thanks to the ancestors and the people who came before you and made your life possible, and also to the actual food itself for giving its life to sustain you. So parsley is a very sacred plant in that regard. We um, the connections, and this is across cultures. This is um, in Italian culture. This also is in Persian culture. It's kind of interesting how many of those do cross over to the Middle East and to um, the Mediterranean. Um, so parsley is something that you should always grow in your garden in a pot because they are very fragile. The roots are fragile, and it's considered bad luck to give a cutting or try to transplant them. So if you can get an already uh, grown plant and just pot it, that's the best way to do it. Um, and use that in your offerings, especially for all souls. Uh, it is just a magnificent plant. And when you sit down to have a meal and you have the parsley garnish on top, just take a second and thank your ancestors for um, our particular place in the world in this time and thank whatever you have in front of you for giving its life to sustain. So now let's move along because I don't want to run out of time. We have cherries. Now, <clears throat> cherries, a uh, cherry tree, if you can have a cherry tree in your home, I highly recommend planting cherry trees. It's considered to be the lifeblood of the house. And the cherry tree has four different aspects to it, depending on the season. So when you have the spring flowers that are just appearing, it's that wonderful feeling of love and um, the excitement of spring, the life is coming back. And, you know, those ones, you can use the petals to press them. You can make different types of jellies um, with the petal, rose, um, not rose, I'm sorry, cherry petals, which is just absolutely lovely. In the summer, you have the fruit, and that is primarily what I work with um, when it comes to cherries. And I put a recipe in it that comes from my French, uh, Laurent side of the family. Um, because they have a very old, old cherry tree in their home. And it is uh, using the leaves uh, to make a cherry cordial. Let's see. I wonder if that's why the cedar pipe bitter herb is part. It very well could be. This is That's a very good question. I think, um, yes, probably relating back to that uh, connection with death. I, I think that is uh, spot on. <laughs> so 
Um, back to cherry with the cordial, we actually use the leaves themselves, and there's a recipe in the notes. And um, when it's finished, the leaves taste exactly like a beautiful red cherry. It's just an amazing cordial, and it's supposed to be something that represents the lifeblood of the home. So if you have magic that is calling for blood, you actually can use um, the cherry juice or the cherry cordial in replacement of that if the tree is on your land and you have called it, you've grown the tree. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't, you can also get the cherries just at the grocery store and just ask them if you can use them in that manner and generally it, it will be fine. Um, now in the uh, autumn, that is a <clears throat> perfect time to use cherry stone divination. And I have a whole piece written that I will post um, on the class page about using the pits for different types of divination. It's kind of like using runes. Um, you carve things onto the little cherry pits. Now, cherry pits are extremely toxic. So if you um, crush even a few of them, it, it becomes basically like a type of cyanide. So don't poison anybody <laughs> but, or yourself, but just something to be aware of. They do have a, a little deadly side as well. <clears throat> now, in the uh, winter, this is the perfect time to take a branch to make a wand from um, a cherry tree. It's the optimal moment to do so. So those are the ways that the cherry throughout the four seasons um, is extremely useful. Now, the last plant I'm going to talk about, and then we'll get on to distillation, is the blackberry. Now, blackberry is another plant that is showing you all its uses and the way that it grows. So here in Washington state, we have the Himalayan blackberry, which is native. And honestly, if we didn't cut it back, uh, probably Washington state would be covered in one big blackberry bramble. <laughs> and probably organ too. So we do cut them back. But remember that the way they're growing, they're growing as protective agents of your land. They're also, because they grow so abundantly and um, in some of the worst conditions you can imagine, like they will grow out of anything, they are a prosperity plant. They show diligence in the face of any type of difficulty. They overcome it and they become abundant. They give us fruit in the summer, which also is sustaining. And of course, they give protection and shelter to other animals. At the farm, we have a huge bramble where um, some wild rabbits live that are just lovely. So we always keep that there. Uh, because of that purpose that they help us and they also help the other animals. Um, they are extremely healing. I have a recipe for that is in the notes um, for a gargle that can be used uh, for sore throats using just the leaves. So those are some things. And of course, I think I will add a little bit later uh, one of our recipes for a blackberry wine, which I forgot to put in the notes. So I'll, I'll put an extra recipe in there for blackberry wine, which is extremely evocative when you drink it of um, a very mystical, rooting, powerful plant. It's, it's quite quite wonderful. So blackberries, I respect them. I love them. I find them to be intriguing and excellent guardians of your land if you have enough space to have them. Now, I want to talk next quickly about potion making because I know many of you are very curious about doing this. So if you want to make your own potions, it's a very, very simple. And actually, I might have Joe Michael go to a full screen for this one because I have some things to show you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so for potion making, you can have an alembic, which is a much more traditional still if you're going to be doing considerable amounts, which I use. But if you want to do just small amounts, I'm just going to show you some of the things you need. You literally just need one of these. Um, it's just basically a stock pot. It's enamel where it tends to work the best. It holds the heat the right way. Um, I would highly recommend beginning with something like mint. Mint is very easy to distill. It's um, just a wonderful plant to work with. I absolutely love it. And you'll have uh, 
no problems getting a wonderful oil the very first go at it. And all you have to do is just literally gather a big bunch of mint, put it in the pot, and then um, put about enough water where it covers um, all of the plant matter. And then you take just one of our <laughs> great little vegetable steamers, put this on top of the plants and the water. So normally when we're cooking, we put it, I mean, we put the plant matter here. It's actually going to go underneath. And then in the middle here, we want to use just a very simple little ramekin that can support heat. So this goes inside of your stock pot on top of the plants and the water. So once it's all in there, now, this is the part where you need to be careful when you're doing it that you don't burn your hands because it can get really hot. Um, you just want to flip your lid upside down. And what's going to happen is the steam is going to come up the sides and it's going to actually pull right here on the lid and it's going to drop into the ramekin. And that's how you're going to get all of your essential oil. If you want to, you can also put a little bit of um, ice on the top that kind of keeps uh, it just helps um, break down the oil a little bit faster, but you don't have to. I actually don't when I'm doing anything with flowers. I feel like it can it can make the smell um, can make the perfume a little harsher. Um, I do it just with the steam. Now with mint, it's totally fine. You can do it. It will speed up the process a little more. You want to keep your um, you want to keep your flame or your heat source at a very, very low simmer because if it overflows, it will get inside of your oil receptacle and you don't want that. You have to start over. So some plants like mint, you use everything, the stems, the leaves, the whole thing. Just put it in. Now with, and don't set off the smoke alarm. Is that Jen? <laughs> Jen and I potioned together and one year we had an epic fire alarm. It's, it's happened. It was pretty great. So check your fire alarms. Make sure it doesn't go off because you're drinking wine somewhere else while it's working. Um, and most plants, you need to give it some time, like about an hour, 45 minutes, just a slow simmer. <laughs> yeah, it's just a very, very low, very slow simmer. And you'll get a nice amount of oil in about an hour. You can let it steam much longer to get as much as you possibly can out of it, but then it might end up getting a little um, diluted. So I say about an hour to two hours. Now, when I do my lilac potions, I actually let the lilac flowers go for much longer, about three hours is ideal, and that is two to three hours. Um, <clears throat> in that particular case, you need to only use the flower and not have any green matter in there at all, or it'll give it that green kind of um, aroma instead of a floral aroma. Now, the violets are one of the ones where you can use leaves and flowers together and um, just pop them in there. Now, does anybody have any questions real quick? And then I'll talk about a compendium. Compendium, sorry, I say it the French way. No, okay, so I'm going to move on now. If anyone has any questions about distilling, it's a very simple process, and I have it all written down in um, the book. The other thing, um, in the notes is when you are working with your plants, give yourself a second at the part where you're um, harvesting and then when you're working on the actual, especially with like the lilacs when I'm taking off all the little flowers, I really take that moment to just um, let myself uh, focus on the intent of what my potion is going to be. And I kind of meditate on it in that particular way. And so it is infused within that particular potion. I also do that at the po point when I get into bottling, but I feel like there's just this, as you're actually touching the flowers and you're working with the plant matter, you're really connecting with the energy of those particular flowers and they're, they're, it's very beautiful and symbiotic. So that is an excellent way. Oh, five, oh good, I have five more minutes, great. <laughs> I thought I had less. Um, so yes, if anyone has any more questions about any of the distilling um, portion of it. I, if you ever do decide to get an alembic, I highly recommend recommend it if you're going to be doing large batches. It's a little bit more complex, like the whole, um, the the way that you do it. The, the other thing I have to say is um, most flowers, for the most part, can be distilled or plants 
always check and make sure that you're using something um, that isn't toxic or <laughs> in any way in this that particular form. But I would say that many of our regular plants that we use, um, you are able to do this. Herbs are an excellent example of something that you can extract, especially oregano is a wonderful oil to have on hand. Um, rosemary, um, let's see, rosemary, oregano, mint, uh, basil, all of these are just great and you can grow them in your garden pretty abundantly and you can grow them in an apartment, which also makes it an excellent um, <clears throat> companion. You could have it on a little balcony. You could have it in just your uh, kitchen window uh, garden, which um, I have always found when we lived in apartments in France, I always had to have my little kitchen garden uh, or whichever window was facing um, the most light. And also in uh, my balcony, we had that as well. But I, so I understand apartment living um, with plants can be a little more challenging but also very rewarding when you have your your small garden with you all the time. Um, I also want to talk about building your own book and your compendium. Now, the one that I uh, want to show you, because I'm still trying to find where mine is, it's still packed in my garage somewhere since our last move. We're still unpacking. But this is one that I've started using because we have it at our shop. It's the Flora Forager Journal. And it actually has, um, I love how it's divided by seasons. And I highly recommend finding a book um, that's like that or creating your own book and dividing it up by the season. The reason I like that is every year you can leave room to add to it. So here's an example of, you know, I just, there's just a lovely little picture made with the leaves. But then I, um, I like to just take time when I find a plant uh, that I want to work with in the garden or if we're just out and it catches my eye and I either am familiar with the plant or I'm not familiar with the plant and I need to look it up. Um, take time to just do a little research on the plant, but more than anything, write a portion of your, your journal or your, your magical book where you or put your recipes or your different workings. Um, take time to just write how you feel in that particular moment when you cultivate or harvest the plant, um, what's going on in the world around you at that time, because all of those things you might look back, you know, two years from now, and it might have a light bulb moment of, oh, I understand why that plant came into my life at that particular moment. And I love you all. And I will, I could just talk forever about this. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed. And if you have questions, just let me know. <laughs> Andrea, that was an amazing class, and I think I could speak for all of us that we could listen forever. Um, <laughs> there, there, I'm sure folks have, have questions, and more will come up as, as, uh, as more of the folks that are still trying to find their way around in the room um, find the video. So we encourage everybody to do that. Thank you so much. That was awesome. You're welcome. Guys who are watching, um, I, I want to uh, to do two things. One, I want to let you know that if, if you're looking for more information, um, definitely get in touch with Andrea either in the group here or go to andreasavar.com. And um, we are going to be starting with our next class in about um, uh, five, six, seven, eight, about eight minutes. Um, so that gives you time to run and use little boys room, little girls room. <laughs> Come back here, and we will look forward to um, uh, to seeing you guys in the next video. The next video should pop up automatically in the group. It will be Chris Allen, and he's going to be talking about connecting with your deities. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys there. So I'm going to go because I have to make a little pit stop as well. Me too. <laughs> Love you. Thank you. Love you too. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.